So I am part of a family with the surname Hembry. It's a big deal in our family to be a Hembry. Our family settled land in Oklahoma during the Oklahoma land rush in 1893. And the land that my great grandpa settled, our family is still farming. The sons and grandsons are still there. So it's a big deal to be part of this family. A lot of you don't think Oklahomans can have pride, but we can. <laughs> Uh, I was born there. I've been in Texas most of my life. But, you know, you just don't forget your roots, right? And there is something about knowing the people that you come from. My grandmother was one of nine brothers and sisters that were born on the farm and raised on the farm. And one of those brothers was named Bob. And Bob committed his entire life to tracking down the details about our family. He went over hill and dale. He crossed states. He crossed countries. He crossed the ocean over to England. He went under fences into graveyards. He documented everything he could. And the end result is that we all received one of these binders oh my that documents everything he discovered about our family. And if you boil down all that information, it basically boils down to these 16 pages of genealogy chart, a pedigree chart. So let's start on the first one. <laughs> I will not bore you with the details of my beloved family, but I will tell you that as I started going through this, the first thing that caught my eye was Lady Jane Bridget North, born at Brockett Hall in England in 1583. I am descended from Lady Jane. <laughs> you may all bow before me on your <laughs> Well, that was just fascinating. And so I just, I kept digging and I kept looking and I'm like, well, that has got to be the highlight of our family tree. But if I kept going back and I kept going back and I kept going back on my family tree, born in 1207 is Henry III. Yes. Now don't I feel royal. <laughs> Edward I, King of England. Henry I, William the Conqueror, 1027. In fact, you can take our family tree all the way back to, oh, Bernard, King of Italy. Like, I knew I loved Italian food for a reason. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's like more than most people, I love it. But if you go all the way back, he traces back our lineage to 741 AD because of all the research that he did. And there's just something about knowing who you are and where you come from and your roots that gives you a sense of permanence and a sense of place and a sense of belonging. And I'm so glad that Uncle Bob did that. And I, I know that these things are true because Uncle Bob said so. <laughs> <laughs> but also because Uncle Bob did his research. Well, when we think about this idea of place and belonging, we all have questions. Questions beyond just, who are my people? Which is a great one to ask. We have questions about what is our place in the greater world? What's my relationship to the other creatures in the world? That seems to be a big question these days, doesn't it? What is my relationship and my obligation to other humans? Do I really have one? Is my life purposeful or just an accident? What's the meaning of life, by the way? And how do I relate to God? These are big questions. And my personal genealogy won't answer those questions. Discover, to discover the answer to those questions, we need a different kind of record. And God has given us that record in the book of Genesis. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. It's a foundational book of all human existence. But more than that, it is God-breathed revelation of God himself as it's demonstrated in his relationship with his creatures. How do we know who God is? He shows us in relation to how he connects to us. So as we prepare to study this book, we are going to look at Genesis from three areas before we start digging into the verses. We're going to look at the significance of the book. We're going to look at the source of the book. And we're going to look at the structure of the book. And by doing that, we then can dive in and be able to look at it in such a way that we know that we're going to be looking at it accurately, appropriately, and with the best advantage for growing and getting to know God better. 
So let's start with the significance. The book is named from the, the original Greek name, of, I'm sorry, the original Hebrew name of the book is actually taken from the first word of the verse. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, Bereshit. So the Hebrews would call this book Bereshit, in the beginning. We know the book by the word Genesis, which comes from the Greek word Genesis, which means origins. And that title was given to this book when the when 70 scholars translated the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, into Greek. And that was called the Septuagint. And the reason that they did that was because at the time, the trade language, the common language of the known world was Greek. And so if you wanted to be able to read the Bible, then you needed to have it in a language that was accessible. And so it was translated. And so we know it by that name. Um, it, in it, we discover the origins of the universe and the earth and all living things and humans. It gives us the origins of God's relationship to man, the origins of Israel, through whom God desired to bless the whole world. And so it makes sense that they would give it the name Origins. It is a book of origins um, that is the foundation of more than one book. So to really understand the book of Genesis, we need to understand that it is an integral part of another work. It is one of five parts of a writing that is known as the Torah or the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The, that, those five books were written as a whole, and they were meant to tell one full story. And so to think, as we think about the idea of Genesis, we have to think about it in its place there to the five. So how does it fit into that place of five books? Well, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy tell the story of Israel's exit from Egypt, where they had been captive slaves, where they had stayed in Egypt for over 400 years. And it tells the story of how God intervenes and miraculously works to set those people free. At this point, estimated one to two million people coming out of a family that went in by just a few dozen. And so they're now exiting Egypt. They're following this God that many of them don't really know, and they're going to be traveling toward a place that he has promised to give them. So that's the four books, Exodus through Numbers. So what is Genesis? Genesis is the prequel to that. Genesis is the way that they were going to have their questions answered. So you can imagine they had questions. They're coming out of Egypt. They've been slaved. They're now set free. They don't know where they're going, and, and they're having an interaction with this God for the first time, many of them. And so they had to have wondered, who are we? Where are we going? And what is the nature of this God who is working among us? So when we read Genesis, we have to be mindful of the agenda of the writer and the audience that he was informing. There was a specific audience. It was the Israelites coming out of Egypt. This book was written for them for a purpose. And it was helping them understand the history of not only who they are, but who God is. So one of the things that would have been helpful for them is not just creating um, a, a framework for who he is, but also a framework against what else was out in the culture. So we have to know what Genesis is and what Genesis is not. There would have been multiple origin stories in Near East cultures around them. So the Egyptians, the Canaanite, the Mesopotamians, they all had origin stories. How did the world begin? Where did it come from? And they were buried, and our lecture leaders might share some of those later, but certainly you could look them up. One of them was that the world was created from the blood of an evil demon mixed with the chaos waters of the unformed world. And so part of the purpose of the writer of Genesis was to say, here is what's true in relation to what they had heard. So that helps us because if we know what it is, like what, what the point of the creation story was, then we know what it's not. So what was the creation story not intended to do? Well, it was not intended to be a point by point um, debate over Darwinism and evolutionism. So if we go to Genesis and we try to say, why doesn't it explain to me 
how evolution is not true, you're asking the text to do something it was not written to do. There's, that is not its main purpose. Will you find content in there that helps bring clarity to the creation of the world? Absolutely. It was not meant to be a detailed scientific textbook. So we don't get a lot of details about the flood and after the flood. We don't get details about how long a day was. That wasn't the intent of the book. So part of coming to the book is knowing what it is and knowing what it's not and setting your expectations for what it is that we're looking for in this book. Um, so there's no point in critiquing Genesis by today's skepticism um, when it was crafted to speak to the Israelites. Now, there are a lot of things in the book that will be foreign to us because it was written for another audience, right? There are references to traditions and cultures and practices. There are tradition, uh, references to places that no longer exist. And so one of the things that's helpful for us is to take advantage of those who've done the research, like a kebab. So if you have a Bible, a study Bible that has footnotes, that is a great resource for you. So I would say take advantage of that because it can help you have some context so that you're not bringing your 21st century definition of things into a book and confusing your understanding. I would say limit your exploration to the footnotes instead of the commentaries. If your study Bible also has paragraphs and paragraphs of explanation about what it means, then I would ask you don't go there. Because as a student of the Bible, you want to find out what it means. You want to read what it says. You want to interpret it. What does this mean in light of everything else that I'm looking at? And then you'll get to the question of what does it mean to me? The what does it mean requires that we take into account the, the original audience. So use the footnotes because that helps you understand how the original audience related to this. But don't use the commentary until after you've already come to your group, had a discussion, learn from other people, listen to the lecture, and then if you're still hungry for more, go home and read a commentary on it. So the original purpose of the audience has to be considered when we're trying to discover the meaning of the words. But the words in Genesis, like the words of all scripture, go beyond their writing. The entire Bible is one great story where God reveals himself through his relationship with his creatures. There are 66 different writings, 66 different books, but those 66 books tell one story. It tells the story of God's pursuing love toward his creatures from beginning to end. And Genesis lays that foundation for us. It is the book of origins, beginnings. It unfolds and unfolds and unfolds those beginnings throughout all of scripture. In your notebook later, when you get a chance to dig through, you'll find a couple of handouts. And these are just for you to think about and ponder and maybe be like road signs for you to say, well, I'm going to watch for that. Um, in this book of beginnings, we find the foundation for so many things today that we call doctrines, theologies, things that we stand on as truth. And most of the things that we hold dearest are beginning to be exposed and revealed in this book of origins. So God being revealed as creator God as our covenant God, as almighty God, who's powerful. The Trinity, the very first seeds of the Trinity are unfolded in the book of Genesis. The doctrine of sin and separation, the friendship of God, the pursuing love of God, the doctrine of Satan, the first hint of sovereign election, the roots of our salvation, justification, faith, believer security. You can go through the list. But all of the things that we stand on, it is significant that it is in the book of Genesis because it then will be developed as we keep going. There are so many firsts that are just fun to be on the lookout for in the book of Genesis, things that we encounter for the very first time. Angels, altars, light, love, strength, praise, prayer, rewards, blessing, death, fear, rainbows, kingdoms, cities. All of these things find their roots, their origins in the book of Genesis. So that's pretty exciting, but it makes it a significant book. Because without these foundations, it's difficult for us to have a full picture of the rest of the Bible because things find their source here. So we get also a clue from the ending of Genesis itself that this is not meant to be a book in and of itself because it ends on a cliffhanger. 
I hate watching a movie that does not wrap up all the details. I hate listening to an audible book, and I listen a lot when I commute, that you think you're going to get a whole story, but there is a part two. And so they don't resolve all the problems. Genesis is a cliffhanger. So you get to the story of Joseph, and in the story of Joseph, what we find out is that Joseph dies, and he says to them, when you leave this land, what? What? When you leave this land, take my bones with you. And so we're left with a, okay, what's next? When are they leaving the land? And of course, that is the opening of Exodus, this five-part um, uh, document for, for the people to understand their place. So we read Genesis knowing that the details are crucial because there is more to come. God's redemption of Israel makes no sense without the book of Genesis, which is why they needed this story. But also the redemption of Jesus makes no sense without this story. The work of Jesus is anticipated in this record, and it helps us understand his death and his resurrection. <clears throat> so we'll be looking for those things. So remembering that we're bringing a fuller understanding to the Old Testament than the original readers had gives us a unique responsibility. While we want to read for what the original audience heard and what it meant to them, that does not mean that we divorce ourselves from what we also know, the light that we've been given. Some might say that you shouldn't mix the two, but we have to mix the two. And in fact, Jesus himself expected that to happen. Um, there are a couple of places in Luke after Jesus' resurrection where he was reminding his disciples to look to the Old Testament now that they had the light of his resurrection to have clarity about how God had intended this all along. He said to them, you will find it hard to believe all the prophets wrote in scripture. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things? Then Jesus took them through the scriptures, writing of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning him. So when we read in Genesis that a serpent comes and talks to Eve in the garden, we instantly think what? Satan. Satan. Why? Because we have the light of the whole rest of the Bible and the teaching of Jesus himself. It is very unlikely that any of the readers of this book had any clue that that's who this was. When we read in Genesis 3.15 that God is going to bring one who would crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent would strike his heel, we instantly think Satan and Jesus. This would have been a great mystery to them for a very long time. So we bring to it this greater understanding because we have the whole Bible. It has deeply significant impact for Christians today because of what we already know even a greater significance than it had to them, even if it is a different significance. So we bring the fullness and the weightiness to it. The plot of the entire Bible is set in the opening book. I love this. God is determined to have relationship with his people. Um, he's determined to bless them. Genesis 1, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and the animals that scurry along the ground. We focus in on Genesis, I mean, on Eden in Genesis. But the words are, fill the earth, not fill the garden. And so we're going to get to see God's purposes unfolding, even in spite of the disobedience again and again and again of those people that he calls his own. So here's a principle for us. For both the people who first received Genesis and all who read it, this book is meant to facilitate relationship with Creator God. For both the people who first received it and all who read it, this book is meant to facilitate relationship with God. In Genesis chapter 3, we get the story of the fall of man. And I'm sure this isn't Maybe for you it is a spoiler alert, but things don't go well in the garden. <laughs> Adam and Eve both choose to put their own desires and understandings 
and will above God's. And when that happens, their eyes are open. They know they're naked. They're ashamed. And their first reaction is to hide from God. Verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, then the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? There is the theme of the Bible. God's pursuing love, his determination to know and bless his creatures. Where are you? They lost their residence in the garden. And at that point, they had lost their relationship, their intimate relationship with God. But which one is he concerned about restoring? The relationship. If you were in our Revelation study last year, then you know that residence is also going to be restored at some point. But the point is relationship. Everything God does in interaction to man from this point on is about restoring relationship. Where are you? So that would be a question I would ask you today. If God is saying to you, where are you at? It's not that he doesn't see you. But is it that do you see yourself hiding? Do you see what you're doing in this relationship? Is there any place in your life where God would be saying to you, where are you? Some place that you've hidden something away, some place that you've refused to give access, some place you've refused to surrender obedience, something in your life that you're keeping to yourself because you're afraid or you're ashamed. God would say, where are you? That is, a, that is not a question. It is an invitation to step out and to enter in his presence and to let him transform whatever it is through his relationship with you. So Genesis has the power to do that, just like every other part of the Bible. Let's also look at the source of the book. How did this book come to us? Who wrote the book of Genesis? Well, most people would quickly raise their hand and say definitively, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. It's almost as easy as the um, Jesus Sunday School answer. Actually, technically, there is no claim to authorship in the book of Genesis. And while it's very likely, seems very, very certain that whoever wrote Genesis also authored the other four books of the Pentateuch, there's also no claim to authorship in those four books. No place does Moses say, I wrote this book. This was from the pen of Moses or anybody else add that in there. And so here's our question. Can we have confidence that Moses was the author of Genesis and the next four books? Probably but with some caveats that are important to know. Um, on the affirmative side of feeling like, yeah, we can say confidently that Moses wrote this, there are a lot of internal references in the scriptures to Moses receiving divine revelation directly from God, that he would have access to information that could be shared. We first see him at the burning bush in the presence of God, um, being called to be a spokesman. We see him on Mount Sinai receiving the law. We see him in the tabernacle where the presence of God is. We hear God's conversation to him recorded for us when he is praying. So we know that he had access to divine revelation that is shared in this uh, record. We also know that he had the habit of writing things down, right? He wrote down the law. Uh, he wrote down a song. So he's also one who has a habit of recording. Certainly had the capability to do so. We also have some internal um, signs that refer to probably it was Moses. In Joshua, the book of Joshua, which is the very next book that takes the people into the land, Joshua has been given the mantle of leadership. It's been assigned to him by God from Moses. And now he's taking over and God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous for you are the one who will lead the people to possess all the land I swore to your ancestors. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them. So we get the idea that that is probably referring not just to the law, but to all of those five books in the Pentateuch. There are also internal references from Second Chronicles, Ezra, Hebrews, several places where the book of Moses is referred to. So we can have confidence that Moses probably was the primary writer of this book. And I say primary because there are some other things that we need to note. Um, and that is 
that there are some things that we might call discrepancies or things that you could argue that Moses couldn't have written this book. One of the most obvious is in Deuteronomy 34 where the death of Moses is recorded. <laughs> so it's doubtful that that was a prophetic recording. Somebody came in afterwards and added the record of the death of Moses. Um, there is a spot where you're probably familiar that Abram, God calls Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans, that right out of the, of the Chaldeans. Well, at the time and throughout the lifetime of Moses, Ur was not referred to as Ur of the Chaldeans. That was much later. Um, there is a story in um, uh, the, the, one of the parts of the Pentateuch that references a city called Dan. Well, Dan hadn't been a city yet. It was Laish. And so somebody would have had to come in and edit that. So clearly there was some editing done on this. How much? We're not sure. It would have been post-Moses. We need to acknowledge that. If we don't acknowledge it, why is it important? Because if we don't acknowledge it, we come to these things and we go, okay, there's something wrong here. This word, God's word can't be right. So we need to understand the sources of this so that we can understand when we read reach areas that um, have discrepancies. Another thing that is argued for those who would say it couldn't possibly be Moses, but it actually can, is the voice of the writing. So as a writer, and if you read books, then you know that your favorite author, you can always tell something they wrote. They have a certain cadence about how they write. They have a certain way to put sentences together. They have a certain vocabulary that they use. That's called the author's voice. And so Moses has a very particular voice when he writes. But then we come to some sections and we think, well, that's odd. That doesn't quite sound like the other sections. Um, or it could be like we get Genesis 1 and 2, but then Genesis 3 restates a lot of what was in Genesis 1 and 2 in a slightly different way. So what would be the cause of that? Well, for that, I will point you to my Uncle Bob. <laughs> now, my Uncle Bob, when he was putting this together, um, didn't have divine revelation. He did have some direct contact with immediate family members, and he had some stories that he could go off of. But if you're going to go back to 741 AD, you need other sources. So just out of my book, there are, this is a picture of a cemetery that he climbed under the fence to read the tombstones. There are old military records that he dug up and quoted from. There are names and rosters that he pulled from. There are firsthand accounts and stories that were written and passed down through the family. This one is by great-great-grandmother Sarah Wilhout Hembry. She was forced from her home near Springfield, Missouri during the Civil War. She was a widow. My great-grandmother followed the Union Army for protection. See Exhibit A. After the Civil War, Andrew Jackson Hembry migrated to Kansas and became a blacksmith. I have in my possession a few of his tools. So there were first-hand accounts that were passed down. Newspaper articles. Old photographs. And old resources. All of that to say that for him to be thorough, he scoured every possible source. And if you go through the notebook, you will find that he quotes a lot of those sources as opposed to just summarizing them. So it is assumed that Moses track down many sources to use. Some may have been written, some may have been oral tradition. And so we know he had access. And so when that happens, when the voice changes, or when we get a, a vocabulary that he doesn't usually use, we can say probably he took material, insert here, and he used that to create his record. Make sense? Again, important, because we need to be able to trust the accuracy of what we're reading. And we need to be able to understand when there are discrepancies that we come to. This. Now, I love this. I just wanted to give you this uh, insight into the uh, idea of passing things down orally. Uh, at this point, there would not have been access to many writing materials, maybe not a lot of literacy. So if you've ever played the telephone game, and you think, oh, gosh, how could he get accurate records? I mean, I can't even go through 10 people. You know, I get to the end and it says I should wear my swimsuit on Mars. And it started out, would you like to go to dinner? <laughs> we're not really good at that, right? Because we're not good listeners. But when your entire culture is based on oral tradition, you memorize, you practice, you hand down. These are important. This is the only record 
that many of them had of their families. And so they would have been very, very precise. And just to give you an idea of how not difficult it actually might have been, you have this chart. Now, on the bottom of this chart, it gives you some of the first 20, it calls them patriarchs. I would call them progenitors, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But these would have been in the first 20 that are listed and how long Scripture says their life was. So you can see how all of them overlap. And then if you go up to the top with the arrows, it gives you a little bit clearer. Adam could talk directly to Methuselah and actually even Lemek. I don't know why they didn't do Lemek. Lemek is the father of Noah. So Noah's father would have had, could have had direct access to hear the story of creation from the man who was created without the belly button. So when we think about these oral traditions, I mean, it is good for us to know, look what God has done. One of the benefits of these extended lifespans was that God was preserving the record of events and people. So we've got Adam to Methuselah or Lamech. Then we go directly to Shem. Uh, Noah's son, Shem survives the flood, and he lives long enough to be alive for Abraham and Abraham's son, Isaac. So when we think about how did they know these things, Isaac lives long enough for his grandson, Levi, who is long enough for to talk to Moses, his father, Amram. Pretty interesting, isn't it? I just want you to have that little tidbit in your bowl. <laughs> okay, so the details matter. But here's the thing to remember, too. Regardless of the human authorship, we also can be certain of the divine authorship. Everything that God wanted in this record is in it, and everything God did not want in this record is not in it. We are told in Hebrews 4.12, um, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, that all scripture, all, even the very earliest scripture is inspired by God and that it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? So that we will be adequate and equipped for every good work. So we can be sure of that. So let's do a principle. We can trust that the book of Genesis is able to teach, correct, train, and equip for every good work because its author is God. Because its author is God. So how do you come to scripture? Do you come with it with the attitude as I'm reading a textbook? Or do you come to it with the attitude of this is a living word? We are told in, uh, in uh, Hebrews that it is alive and powerful. Hebrews 4.12. It's sharper than a sword with two edges. It cuts between soul and and spirit between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Do you still want to study the book? <laughs> <laughs> Everything is laid bare before the eyes of him who created the world. And that includes us. We examine the word of God, ladies, but the word of God examines us. When you come to the word of God, be prepared to be examined. It's more than just a book. All right, and then quickly, let's look at structure. I've given you another handout. Um, there's a story of um, written by uh, Lewis Banks called The Fisherman and His Friends, and basically it's a story of a ship that goes out to sea, and they're approaching a big storm, and one guy is put out on the deck and is exposed to all of the elements where he's supposed to be taking care of things in this raging storm, and the other one is in a very protected place on deck. And at the end of the storm... The one who is in the protected place is washed off and drowns. But the one who is out in the exposed deck, he survives. And the difference is the guy exposed on the deck had something to hold on to. That's what structure is. The structure of each book and the Bible as a whole gives us something to hold on to. So that we're not just drowning in all these words trying to figure out what do I do with it. And so there are two or three different ways to look at structure. Very briefly, I will. I gave to you a copy of um, Chuck Swindoll. I love this. This is just a great chart to put in your book because it basically gives you sort of an overview of the whole structure. This is one way to look at it. He's got it divided up. Even though you see eight things across the top, he really has it divided up in two sections, right? There is the 
primeval section verses one chapters one through eleven, and there is the patriarchal section verses twelve through fifty. Primeval just means the beginning of time, right? So we get all the stories that are like the first stop where humankind is getting established, and that is contingent on four events: creation, fall, flood, nations. That's what we'll be studying this semester. We will be looking at the primeval section and it will all hinge on, we'll be holding on to what we're learning through these four different events. Next semester, we get into the patriarchal section. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, those are our handles. Four events in the first section, four people in the second section. The first section is the beginning of the human race. The second section is the beginning of the chosen race where Israel is singled out. We go from confusion and scattering to bondage in Egypt. Um, the first section covers 2,000 years. The next section covers 300 years. So we're speeding through all of these major events, and then we're going to slow down, and the narrative is going to give us a lot of details about these, these personal lives. There is another way that some people do structure the book, and that is through these keywords and phrases. There are uh, 10 places in this book where the word teledot in Hebrew, Elah teledot, is used. And that word translates roughly um, the generations of or the account of. And every time it's used, except for the very first one in 2 4, when it's um, an account of heaven and earth, all the other 10 times, it denotes the beginning of a list of names. A name is next. And so in, in a lot of ways, that name sort of is like, okay, we're moving to a different part of the story. We're moving to a different significant part of the story. So you could divide it up structure-wise by those 10 things. At the very least, we will be looking for those 10. Um, the person who's named is not necessarily the key person, but it is the beginning of that family line. And so that's another way to look at it. Uh, obviously, key verses for us are Genesis 3, 15 and 12, 3 which put us back to looking for Jesus in these verses. And we will be looking for him as we go through. So two ways to look at it, actually three. You can look at it primeval, patriarchal. You could look at it by those 10 teledot transitions. One more way to look at it is you can divide up. It is often divided up. That last section, instead of it being all patriarchs, it is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's story up through 36 patriarchs. Technically, Joseph's not a patriarch. When you go through scripture and they refer back to their forefathers, their patriarchs, they say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those three. And so Joseph is a bridge in many ways from the promises to the patriarchs to the fulfillment of the promise in the promised land. And so we will definitely be looking at him. In a lot of ways, Joseph is also a picture of Jesus and his work for us. And so he's a pivotal, pivotal? pivotal character for us. He also, in many ways, states the point, the path for redemption. In Genesis 50, 20, he says to his brothers, after he's been separated from them, after they've done really stinky stuff to them, we're going to study that. They finally come to him, and rather than railing on them, he forgives them, and he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. He brought me to this position so that I could, I could save the lives of many. Jesus demonstrated that. It did not say those words. Picture on the cross, Jesus' words. You meant this for harm, but God intended it for good. He brought me to this position of giving up my life so that I could save the lives of many. So wonderful to be able to take everything we know of the New Testament and transpose it on top of this book to even give more depth, more significance, and more meaning to our own relationship with Jesus. So within the structure of orderly content, we will be looking for all of the connections for the whole Bible. So here's a principle. God uses all of his word to eliminate, to illuminate. God uses all of his word to illuminate the way to redemption in his son. Terrible if he eliminated it. <laughs> he illuminates it. I loved going through the book that Uncle Bob gave us. Um, there were so many little tidbits that are interesting. I'm so happy to know that I descend from kings and ladies and, and you know, Italians. 
<laughs> but I also found this little tidbit in here. Notes. I don't know if it's true or not, but when I was a little girl, I remember a tale about a Hembry name that was changed over the years. I remember hearing that it was changed because some of the Hembrys were bootleggers. <laughs> and they were trying to get away from the law. I have no idea if it's true. <laughs> By the mouth of two witnesses, the thing is established. <laughs> there is another note in here where somebody affirms that, yes, my family were bootleggers. They ran from the law, and one was even accused of murder. <laughs> you know, I love that God, like Uncle Bob, does not polish up and sugarcoat the truth. As we go through the book of Genesis, the last thing to remember, on the road to redemption, we are going to read things that we don't understand. We are going to read things that we don't like. We are going to see God not intervene when his people do things that we consider outrageous and unethical and cruel. Same will be true if you go through Exodus and through the story of them entering into the land of Canaan. Ours is not to judge people who went before us. They lived in a different time. God was establishing a different thing. But here's one of the affirmations that we know that the word of God is accurate and true. Bootleggers are listed too. <laughs> and when we get to that, we just trust God with what we learn from it, what it reveals to us, and then, of course, what we can do to grow closer to God because of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these women, for this book that is going to be such an exciting adventure to go through, Lord. The beginning of the whole world. And you have shared the truth about how you brought it into being. Because you wanted to know us. You wanted creatures to love and to love you. Father, we are your creatures. We love you. So thank you for this book. Thank you for every woman who's here, who's committed to searching the scriptures and letting the scriptures search her. Father, we pray that it would yield much fruit. And more than anything, Father, we pray that we would know you. You reveal yourself in Genesis. And that is the goal. Help us dig for it as if it is treasure and find the silver and gold. In Jesus' name, amen.